you, you started out your interview with me by kindly saying I was one of the world experts on fine tuning. You were surely one of the world's experts on quantum cosmology. So I would like to, Thank you. to, to, to start off by asking you some questions about quantum cosmology. And maybe I should preface this by saying thank you to, to you as a representative of quantum cosmologists because the whole theme, the whole discussion of, of fine tunings and the anthropic principle used to be regarded with disdain by many physicists. It was regarded as being philosophy or flaky or even theology. The fact that it has now become respectable to talk about these things is to a large extent due to the f to people like you. It's, it's due to the fact that other mainstream physicists um, from string theory and, and from quantum cosmology have in some sense made the subject respectable by giving us a physical basis for, for taking the concept of, of a multiverse in particular seriously. So let me thank you, for, as a, and indeed everyone who works in You're welcome, I think, is what's traditional to say, right? It, we were just led into it uh, naturally. Mm -hmm. It seemed inevitable. However, I think maybe I should just first ask you to explain in very simple terms actually what is quantum cosmology, and then in specifically I'm going to ask you more about your own no-boundary proposal. So how, do, how would you describe quantum cosmology in simple terms? Well, we have quantum mechanics uh, as since for the last century. Uh, it's probably the most successful theoretical uh, framework in the history of physics. Uh, various applications of it explain why the sun shines, why uh, transistors work, why uh, your atoms don't penetrate the atoms of your chairs, leading you to fall on the floor, all sorts of everyday phenomena. Michael Turner used to claim that 85% uh, of uh, the US GDP was due to quantum mechanics. Mm. He was thinking, of course, of the electronics industry. Mm. So it's central to all explanation in physics. So it's an inevitable um, inference from the physics mm. of the last century that we live in a quantum mechanical universe. More where money in quantum theory than relativity. Yes, indeed. <laughs> We live in a quantum mechanical universe where um, you know, the, all the basic laws of physics conform uh, to this framework. Now, the evidence, what I've been talking about is um, where quantum mechanics has been successful is on small scales, maybe not as far as the sun goes, but that's still small in the, the size of the universe, and we're really talking about uh, the combinations of nuclei going on in the center of the sun. But in cosmology, uh, if we extrapolate back, we reach the Big Bang, and large and small are one right, at this time. So it's inevitable conclusion that this is a quantum mechanical era, right, uh, where in fact the theorems of general relativity tell us that the ordinary classical description uh, breaks down. So it's very natural to try to apply quantum mechanics to the universe as a whole. We don't know whether that will work, right, because we haven't extrapolated to those, but it, we should try. Uh, that's the subject of quantum cosmology. Understanding the entire universe in quantum mechanical terms. And in particular, you can address the question of what happens at the Big Bang. When right, precisely, mm -hmm. exactly. What do we even mean by what happens mm -hmm. when it's applied to the uh, Big Bang? So, in um, every quantum mechanical system, has a quantum mechanical state. So if the universe is a quantum mechanical system, it too has a quantum mechanic, mechanical state. It has a wave function. It has a wave function of the universe. So quantum cosmology, uh, when we talk about the wave function of the universe, people are familiar with the idea that uh, there's a duality between particles and waves. For example, it was expressed in electron uh, diffraction, this is the universe as a wave, mm -hmm. right? Uh, not as a particle mm -hmm. or, or, or a geometry. And you, of course, have an analogy for the Schrodinger equation for this wave function. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. so, uh, but the question is, without worrying about what equation it is, what is it? Right. Right. That's the problem of quantum cosmology. What is the wave function? What is the wave function? Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, uh, nature of physical theory, most up to now, has been to dealing with dynamics, even in quantum mechanics. Right? You deal with the dynamics of atoms, 
uh, and, uh, and so forth, and not with what state the system is in, because in experiments you can prepare the state, you can choose it, mm. right? But we don't get to choose the wave function of the universe, uh, it's too late. Right? Uh, so, it must be part of the fundamental theory itself. Uh, so, you can posit what the wave function is as a um, part of the final theory, and then check its predictions with observations, just like you might postulate a fundamental theory of dynamics, like string theory, and check its implications in an accelerator. So when you say That's dynamics, right. is, that, is that the analog of the Schrodinger equation in some sense? The yes, right, yeah. right. The Schrodinger equation, or it's the Hamiltonian in particular that's yeah. in, the, in the Schrodinger equation. So that's the effort, mm -hmm. is to propose a theory of the state, the wave function of the universe, and then extract its implications and see if they agree with, um, with uh, what we observe of the universe, especially on large, on large scales. And of course in ordinary quantum mechanics you then have the problem of, well, You've got the Schrodinger equation, but you've also got the problem of the collapse of the wave function and, and how that is described. So the analog of that in quantum cosmology? Um, so ordinary quantum mechanics has to be generalized in the mm -hmm. sense of Copenhagen quantum mechanics to apply uh, to closed systems, right, like, um, uh, like the universe, let us say, is. Right, so the, uh, the, the idea of Copenhagen quantum mechanics was the world could be divided into two pieces. There was a classical world, which we inhabited, and there, there was the quantum world, which was the system that was being looked at. It was a theory whose outcome was the probability for measurements mm -hmm. carried out mm -hmm. by observers on the system, mm -hmm. and it gave the probabilities for the result of those measurements. The observers were outside in the classical world, and what was being examined were atoms, molecules, and things in the quantum world. But you can't have a formulation like, like uh, quantum mechanics like that for cosmology because uh, there is no fundamental reason to divide the universe into two pieces, one of which is observing the others. And if you want to talk about the early universe, uh, there were no observers around, plausibly, and no measurements being made. And yet we would like to predict the probabilities for what the density fluctuations mm -hmm are in the very early universe, that might seem like a very distant problem, but those dis density fluctuations became the stars, galaxies, planets that we see today. So does this mean, Jim, that, is this why you are sort of obliged to adopt a sort of Everett-type Everett view in which the wave function doesn't collapse, that you, you just have a branching into different states? In some sense, in cosmology, in quantum cosmology, do you have to be starting off basically with an Everett view of, of, of interpretation of quantum mechanics? I would say the answer to that is yes, but you will get colleagues that will disagree with that because it's only work. But it, it's a, um, the framework that we use, I think, which is now 30, 40 years old, and goes back even further, as you say to Everett, right, is a theory in which there is no division. The observers are inside. Everything is yeah. inside the... Um, uh, the closed system, and um, the, uh, there, there isn't any, we can, you can say, you can mm -hmm. construct wave functions, there isn't any particular notion of uh, collapse, although it's consistent mm -hmm. with no collapse, so you uh, have it either way, if you like. But the important thing is there's nothing outside okay. looking at it, right? Uh, and that's, so the, the formulation is different. But to be, no, mm, sorry. And yet, you can show that this formulation of quantum mechanics predicts uh, as an approximation the old Copenhagen formulation, as it must do, otherwise it would be inconsistent with a century of, of experiment. So it's not in disagreement with the old way of looking at quantum mechanics. It's a um, generalization of it, right, that applies to closed systems uh, like the universe. And as far as I know, decoherent histories or consistent histories, which are the same thing, is the only formulation that we have that's logically consistent, consistent with experiment as far as we know, that's applicable to cosmology, that's consistent with the rest of modern physics mm -hmm. like special relativity, right, a field theory, uh, and so forth, and is generalizable to deal with quantum gravity. So that's the framework where we're, I where certainly, we're And I personally am very enamored mm -hmm. with that framework myself. But, however, I do know, of course, that there are some people in the quantum community who don't like the many worlds interpretation, uh, if 
are they there for, if if they don't like the many worlds interpretation are they obliged to be skeptical about quantum cosmology as well i wouldn't think so mm. uh, they can just uh, because uh, the baggage that typically people are upset about is the idea that all the other worlds are equally real, whatever yeah. that means. Mm -hmm. The philosophers will explain that too, mm -hmm. right? And uh, they can prove it by using, but you don't have to say that. You can say it just predicts probability for alternatives, like mm -hmm. rolls of a dice. Uh, and so I don't think people really should object. They might object to the baggage. This mm -hmm. is, uh, I think this is simpler. I don't see how they could object. But I mean, they, in the sense that they want there to be a collapse of the wave function in some sense. So can they have can they have a collapse of the wave function and still believe in quantum cosmology? Well, you could write the theory in different ways, one of which uh, it, uh, in some sense collapses. Mm. The key thing, though, it doesn't collapse from, from intervention from something on the outside, like a wave function of a subsystem does when it's measured. Mm. Uh, it just collapses part of a description of what the histories of the, okay. of the system mm. are. But, and now... Jim, I would like to focus, though, on, on the, the no-boundary proposal, mm -hmm. because, of course, I, most people will know that you and Stephen Hawking in the 1980s mm -hmm. made this, this, this really important development, that, you know, the no-boundary proposal, mm -hmm. which in some sense said that time was becoming imaginary mm -hmm. rather than real when you go back to the Big Bang. And, and, and my impression is that that was really was a new spurt of life for quantum cosmology. I mean, it, it, mm -hmm. it was obviously, it was it led to a huge number of people working in the field. So would you like to, to just explain again briefly what the no boundary proposal is? Sure. Um, so as I mentioned, we have to have a theory of the state. Mm -hmm. What is it? Um, let's look at the observations. The observations are that the earlier we go in the universe, it's simpler than it is now. More homogeneous, same in one place as in any other. More isotropic, same in one direction as in any other. Uh, in thermal equilibrium, which is practically the simplest possible uh, state you can imagine, uh, one number, the, uh, the temperature. So the early universe um, seems quite simple. And also there's a story about how present complexity which you've been talking about, mm -hmm. right, emerges from it, from the start of quantum fluctuations, which grew under the action of gravitational attraction, which made the stars, planets, and then evolution and chemistry, mm -hmm. right, and it, it, it took over from that. So let's look for the simplest possible wave function of the universe, because that seems to be what's consistent with the observations. Mm -hmm. um, so usually in ordinary quantum mechanics, uh, the simplest uh, state in a system is the ground state, the one of lowest energy. But in cosmology, if we deal with closed cosmologies, uh, you're faced with a problem that people usually think, of, as I just said, the ground state is the lowest energy you can have. Uh, but in a closed cosmology, there isn't any notion of total energy. In fact, the analog of the Hamiltonian vanishes explicitly. Yeah. Right? Every state would satisfy mm -hmm. it. But also in ordinary quantum mechanics, there's another way of constructing the ground state by something called a Euclidean functional integral. Yeah. I think I'll just leave that. Uh, there's another construction, and that construction does work for cosmology, and it gives the no-boundary quantum state. And Euclidean the in the sense that it is what's requiring um, time to become imaginary. Well, no, I wouldn't say. It, it, we, we take the wave function, yeah. right? And uh, it's true, it involves a Euclidean construction. Right? But the output of the state are probabilities, and they're probabilities for ordinary, not for Euclidean histories, but for ordinary, what would be called Lorentzian histories, with a uh, moment of time. The most striking feature of this quantum mechanical universe, which is carried fundamentally, mm -hmm. characterized by, fundamentally by um, you know, indeterminacy, distributed probabilities, is the amount of predictability it has as represented by what people call the classical realm, ordinary classical physics. Where does that come from in a quantum mechanical universe? It comes because the theory predicts high probabilities for certain sets of alternative histories, right, that they be correlated in time by deterministic laws. Determinism isn't put in in the beginning, it's a consequence, yeah. right, yeah. of 
high quantum prob probabilities. The moon moving around the Earth uh, isn't constrained to move on a Keplerian orbit. It's only that in the present state of the moon, the probability is vastly higher yeah. than any other orbit it could move on, which is all possible orbits. That's the quantum mechanical description of classical. So take the state, which is extraordinarily simple, right, and then see what kinds of classical histories it predicts. And that's essential for your program because, as you've just described, uh, you want the classical histories to exhibit complexity. So the great people sometimes ask me, what do you like about quantum mechanics? Mm. I like the fact that you can have a simple, manageable uh, theory of the beginning, right, that uh, predicts all the present complexity as accidents that happened with certain probabilities on the way, on the way here. Not deterministically, but, uh, but probabilistically. So is the p picture then is that arising out of quantum cosmology with the no boundary proposal, in some sense, I can imagine the superposition of, of many different classical universes in which the, the physics is different, the constants are different. So in some sense, your, your quantum cosmology picture naturally gives a version of the multiverse where I can have different constants. Exactly. Like that. Right. So I agree with that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that is, everything in quantum mechanics has a natural multiverse attack, attached to it because quantum mechanics pr predicts probabilities. If the theory, we said, well, we don't like probabilities, we'd like the theory to predict what we see with probability of one mm -hmm. or something like that, that is unimaginably impossible. We'd have to have a theory of the beginning, right, that would predict where you sat, whether you sat yeah. in this chair, yeah. whether I sat yeah. in this chair yeah. or everything. And so it's hard to imagine that could be simple, manageable, and uh, uh, we could propose it as a, as a theory. But why does having, having all these different universes, why does that necessarily tell you that they're all going to have different values of the constants? For it doesn't, of course, right? Yeah. So, uh, but in simple models, right, we could, so we could put the constants in the, in the mm. dynamical part of the theory, fixed, right? But if the universe mm. predicts a multiverse where the constants vary, and we can describe okay. what those are like, then, um, then uh, it will have something to say about probabilities.